Alexander Gerald Skeel and his twin brother were born in 1995. When they were younger, they became child models for the Asda supermarket chain. During the summer of 2012, 16-year-old Alex unfortunately met and fell in love with Jordan Worth. He saw her as a kind, self-assured, and adorable person. She aspired to become a teacher and appeared to treat everyone kindly. Jordan went on to graduate from the University of Hertfordshire and had even raised money to help children in Africa. Once the relationship was in full motion, Alex's mother, Jed, noticed that Jordan's behavior changed from charming to disturbing. She appeared to play mind games with Alex and would even control how he dressed. She would also complain about how his hair was styled. At first, Alex didn't seem to mind and was only eager to please her and win her approval. Alex's family once took Jordan to the theater in London, and in the middle of the night, she mysteriously disappeared. After a frantic search, they found her an hour later in the hotel lobby giggling. She clearly thought her bizarre actions were amusing, which concerned Alex's family. Then, at Alex's 18th birthday celebration, she insulted a female friend of the family. At this point, Alex had had enough and decided to break up with her. Unbeknownst to the family, Jordan was pregnant and returned a year later in May 2014 with their son, TJ. The couple then reconciled with Alex hoping motherhood would change her strange ways. Now that they were back together, Jordan was allowed to move into Alex's family home. One day, the couple left with their son and went for a drive. While out and about, they spotted the girl Jordan insulted at Alex's birthday party. Jordan then began screaming obscenities at her, and when Alex's mother, Jed, heard about it, she was furious. She told Jordan to stop what she was doing, but all that did was piss her off. So she packed her and her son's things and left. She then gave Alex an ultimatum. If he wanted to be with her, he had to move out of his family's home. Wanting to be close to his son, he made the decision to move into an apartment with her and ceased all communication with his parents. In May 2017, the couple had their second child, a daughter named Iris. At this point, Jordan's control began to escalate. She made him change his phone number to further isolate him from his friends and family. She also hated him playing video games and threw out his PlayStation. She then created a Facebook account in Alex's name and began sending hateful messages to his friends. She also sent Alex's grandfather a text, pretending to be Alex, and said he never wanted to see him again. She then took her devious actions to the next level by telling Alex his grandfather had died, and when he started crying, she criticized him for caring about his family. As time went by, her possessiveness only worsened. She spent Alex's money and then forced him to resign from his job. When you think it couldn't get any worse than that, she convinced him to ingest an entire box of sleeping pills to prove that he was not lying about something. She would even physically abuse Alex on a daily basis. One time, she used a bread knife to cut the tendons in his right hand, and another time, she assaulted him with a hairbrush, breaking his tooth during the attack. He couldn't afford a dentist or borrow a car, so his only option was to rip the tooth out. Eventually, it became routine for Jordan to hit Alex with things like hammers, screwdrivers, and knives. She even poured boiling water on his arms and back and would strike him on the head while he slept, causing him to bleed all over the mattress. There were times she wouldn't even let him eat and forced him to sleep on the floor. Alex became malnourished, but stayed because he was afraid his children would be in danger if he left. Neighbors eventually called the police after hearing Alex begging her to stop hurting him. When they arrived, he took the blame and told them the wounds were self-inflicted. Um, Alex has hurt himself. At the top of the stairs, Alex was sat with a, a towel wrapped around his arm, just blood everywhere. When we questioned it, they were both quite sort of calm and rational and explained that, yeah, you know, Alex has this long-standing history of self-harm. Jordan also lied and said Alex had a history of self-harm. The police had Alex go to the hospital to have his wounds treated, but Jordan quickly arrived and forced him to leave, ignoring the medical staff's advice. 
A few days after the incident, the police were called again, and this time, Sergeant Finn decided to take action. He knocked on the door, and Alex answered. His clothes were covered in grime, and he had numerous wounds covering his malnourished body. So, well, Alex, you want to come and have a chat with me? We'll go upstairs. You all right down here for a minute, Jordan, yeah? If you've been assaulted or anything like that. Sergeant Finn decided to put Alex in his patrol car, hoping if he got Alex alone, he would finally tell the truth. Shoes, mate, where have you got? Wallet, whatever. So, mate, are you coming back here tonight, mate? For me, Nick? Yeah. And, and then I'm going to come back here tomorrow? Yeah. Okay, so you don't really need to in a last-ditch effort, Sergeant Finn turned off his police body cam and told Alex it was now just the two of them talking. At that point, Alex agreed to tell him, but only if he agreed to say the information came from neighbors and not from him. He then admitted to being abused by Jordan. Now that he had a confession, Sergeant Finn marched inside the apartment and placed Jordan under arrest. I explained to you that at the moment you're under arrest on suspicion of assault, occasion, grievous bodily harm. He assumed she would be furious, but instead, she switched on her manipulative personality and tried to kill Sergeant Finn with kindness. Alex was rushed to the hospital to have his burns treated. It was there that doctors told him he was only about 10 days away from death because the burns had become infected. In September 2017, Jordan was charged with 17 offenses, including wounding with intent, causing severe bodily injury on purpose, and controlling or coercive behavior in a close relationship. After being released from the hospital, Alex returned to his family and was reunited with his children. In 2018, Jordan was sentenced to seven years in prison and was the first woman in the UK to be found guilty of controlling or coercive behavior. However, she would only serve half her sentence and was released in January 2022. Alex has since admitted that he was so in love with her that he couldn't break away from the abusive relationship. We generally think of abuse as a man abusing a woman, but in the UK, one-third of all victims are men. Alex is now working with a domestic violence organization to help educate others who might be in similar situations. While prisoners in the UK are banned from updating their Facebook accounts, someone was posting information on Jordan's account suggesting she was the victim of abuse instead of Alex. Thankfully, Alex has since moved on with his life, and Jordan is now engaged to a 28-year-old bricklayer. David Edwards was a well-liked man with a pleasant personality living in Chorley, Lancashire. He was an accomplished defense attorney who took great pride in his job. David eventually fell in love with his best friend, Debbie, and soon after, she became pregnant. He was very excited about fatherhood and attended every one of her appointments. After his daughter was born, he was immediately attached to her and would always rush home from work to be with her. For the first couple of years, David and Debbie were inseparable, but by year five, their relationship began to deteriorate and they mutually agreed to part ways. Seven months later, 50-year-old David met 41-year-old Sharon Manser. David knew Sharon from years earlier when he defended her ex in court for charges of assault against her. However, he was able to convince the court that she lied about being a victim of domestic violence and helped her former boyfriend avoid jail time. One night after the breakup with Debbie, David was browsing through Facebook and came across Sharon's profile and decided to send her a friend request. Their relationship moved quickly and in 2014, she moved into his house. This is when the real nightmare began. One day, David went to pick up his daughter from Debbie and noticed he was drunk and in excruciating pain. She asked him what was wrong, and he said he had fractured his collarbone after falling down the stairs, but Debbie was immediately skeptical of the story. When Debbie first met Sharon, David and she had shown up drunk and attempted to get his daughter. However, Debbie refused and requested David come back when he was sober. This pissed off Sharon, who returned later, trying to beat and kick Debbie's door down, demanding to talk about the situation. 
David was known for being upbeat and generally in the mood to talk. However, over time, his demeanor began to change. One day, he went to pick up his daughter, and Debbie noticed he had a black eye and was covered in bruises and scratches. He then lied to her and told her the injuries were from accidents that occurred around the home. On June 21, 2015, David planned to spend Father's Day with his daughter but canceled at the last minute. Debbie knew what his daughter meant to him and felt something was off, so she rushed over to his house to find out what was going on. When he answered the door, she immediately saw a handprint around his neck along with severe cuts and his lip was split open. He told her he didn't want his daughter to see him like this and once again claimed the injuries were from accidents around the home. However, Debbie knew better, but David refused to go to the police. David and Sharon eventually took a trip to Las Vegas, and while there, on June 28, 2015, the couple married. Even on their wedding day, the abuse didn't stop. The couple had gotten into an argument, which ended with Sharon throwing a phone at David, injuring his eye. While Sharon tried to conceal his injury for wedding photos, you could still see it. At this point, she forced David to stop communicating with Debbie about their daughter, requiring her to go through Sharon. The abuse got so bad that David lost weight and began missing work. When he was at work, Sharon would randomly show up to make sure he was there and would even yell at his co-workers when she couldn't see him. Those close to David began advising him to end the relationship after he told them that she beat him with a coffee table and an ashtray. Debbie was at the point where she feared for her daughter's safety and refused to let David have her. She said the only way he could see her was to come by her home for visitation. It would be two weeks before she would hear from David again. He called and told her that he missed his daughter and finally admitted that the relationship with Sharon was awful. Debbie, fearing for David's life, told him to leave immediately. Sadly, that was the last time she would ever speak to David again. On August 22, 2015, David and Sharon returned from a vacation in Spain. Before their vacation, David had learned that he was about to be laid off from his law firm, which caused even more turmoil in their relationship. David's daughter, now 19 years old, had found her father in the bathroom, bleeding from his chest and leg. She confronted Sharon, who said she didn't mean to hurt him. The couple then went out to a local pub that evening, where witnesses also saw the injuries to David's chest and head still bleeding and said Sharon didn't act concerned at all. After leaving the pub, a police officer found the couple in the middle of the street arguing. His body cam would catch Sharon shout, I'm gonna effing kill ya. I swear, David, when I wake up tomorrow, I don't know what mood I'm going to be in. Four hours later, David's daughter sadly found him in bed, stabbed to death, and immediately called the police. After discovering the long history of domestic abuse, Sharon was arrested and charged with his murder. She then tried to claim that he had walked into the knife she was holding, but the police weren't buying her story. During the autopsy, David was found with 60 exterior wounds, including cuts on his thigh, knee, finger, and head. In the end, Sharon was found guilty of first-degree murder and received a life sentence with a mandatory minimum of 20 years in prison. In 2018, 16-year-old Ayana Sawyer lived in Florida and was a student at Terry Parker High School. Unfortunately, for the past year, she had been in a sexual relationship with her uncle, Jonathan Keyless. While their relationship was very inappropriate, it's of note that the two were not blood-related. However, Ayana ended up pregnant in early 2018. Once she became pregnant, Jonathan began to fear that his family would find out. Plus, Jonathan's wife, Ayana's aunt, was also pregnant. Not wanting anyone to find out, he came up with a plan to get rid of Ayana. So, on December 19, 2018, he lured Ayana to the Ace pick apart where he worked, and he told her they were going to run away together. However, he had no intentions of running away. While Ayana was sitting in a car in the back of the property, Jonathan attempted to strangle her, but it didn't work. So, he pulled out a gun and shot her to death. 
He then used a carpet to conceal the body and put it in a dumpster. Later that day, the contents of the dumpster were emptied at the Otis Road landfill. Once investigators discovered where Ayana's body was, they began sifting through more than 5,000 tons of trash. Sadly, after 16 days, her body was never recovered, but they did find some of her personal belongings. The murder was only discovered after some of his actions that day were caught on surveillance camera. The footage shows him leaving around 11 a.m. in the red minivan she was murdered in. He can then be seen returning an hour and a half later. Weeks after she was reported missing, Jonathan's brother, Joseph Quiles, alerted law enforcement that Jonathan confessed to killing and dumping Ayana's body. After being arrested, he confessed once again to two jail inmates. And one of those conversations was even captured on an audio recording. Sadly, during the trial, it was revealed that Jonathan had even sexually assaulted Ayana's sister. His now ex-wife, Naomi Mobley, remembers the day Ayana was murdered. She remembered that particular day because she was pregnant and up and down all night, but noticed Jonathan sleeping like a baby. She was also shocked when she found out about their relationship and originally didn't believe it. In the end, Jonathan was found guilty of first-degree murder of Ayana and her unborn child and sexual assault. On October 3, 2023, Jonathan was sentenced to life in prison. Sing Pang, who went by Jim, was a rich Taiwanese businessman who founded Ranger Electronic Communications, which marketed CB radios to police forces worldwide. His fortune was estimated to be worth $200 million in the 90s. He lived with his wife, Li Young Pang, who went by Lisa, and their two teenage children in Rancho Santa Margarita, Orange County, California. After marrying, Lisa quit her career to help out her husband. In 1992, 49-year-old Jim met 24-year-old Ran Bing Ji, who went by Jennifer during a work trip to China. Jennifer was working as a manager in the public relations department at a hotel Jim was staying at. The affair with Jennifer quickly took off, and Jim took her back to the United States with him. He then found her an apartment in Mission Viejo, California, just a short distance from the home he shared with Lisa. Jim then began providing her $5,000 a month to fund a new business that would be associated with his. He then had her work from his office so that he could spend more time with her. It wasn't long before Lisa began suspecting Jim of having an affair especially after she discovered women's clothing in their home that didn't belong to her. However, when she approached him about the matter, he didn't try and hide it and confirmed they belonged to Jennifer. Lisa then went to Jim's office and confronted Jennifer, but she refused to stop the affair. Lisa continued to find Jennifer's clothes at the house and demanded that Jim fire her, but he refused. He basically made it clear to Lisa that he would continue the relationship with Jennifer, but was firmly against divorce. He made Jennifer aware of the same. Eventually, Jennifer became pregnant, which Jim was very unhappy about. Regardless, he continued maintaining his double life, and in early 1993, she gave birth to their son, Kevin G. Five months later, things would take a horrible turn for the worse. On August 18, 1993, Jim went to visit Jennifer and his son, but strangely found her apartment door open. Upon entering, he found both Jennifer and Kevin deceased. Jennifer had been stabbed while Kevin was suffocated to death. Jim immediately became a suspect, especially after learning about his double life. However, he had a strong alibi since he was in China on a business trip when the murders occurred. As a result, detectives focused their attention on the other person with a motive for murder, Jim's wife, Lisa. A bite mark was found on Jennifer's body, and it still had saliva in it. From that, they were able to collect DNA and send it off for comparison. When the results came back, it was a perfect match to Lisa's DNA. Even after the DNA results, Lisa continued to maintain her innocence. Jim then requested a moment alone with Lisa before the officers took her into custody. They began speaking in Mandarin, believing they would not be understood. 
However, the recorded audio was translated, and Jim can be heard asking Lisa why she did it. Lisa then incriminates herself by telling Jim that Jennifer had slipped on the knife in self-defense. Jim testified at a preliminary hearing and then left the country and never returned. Two trials later, Lisa was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. If you've never heard of this case, that's likely because her trial was going on at the same time as the O.J. Simpson trial. In a shocking turn of events, California's 4th District Court of Appeals overturned the verdict in October of 1999 because police failed to inform Lisa of her constitutional rights and ignored her numerous pleas for an attorney. During her third trial, the jury deadlocked, prompting the prosecution to offer her a plea bargain. If she agreed to two charges of voluntary manslaughter, she would be given 11 years in prison and, upon release, would be deported from the United States and never allowed to return. She accepted and was deported back to Taiwan after serving her term. As of 2023, Lisa would be in her 70s, but since being deported, there's been no further updates on her. The parents of Jennifer sued Jim for $2 million, claiming he should have known Lisa intended to kill their daughter, yet never took any precautions to prevent it. However, the outcome of the lawsuit remains unknown. Lily Sullivan was born the only child to Anna Sullivan in 2003. Anna described her daughter as a beautiful, kind, and loving individual. By the age of 18, Lily was a college student living in Wales, United Kingdom, and had just started taking driving lessons. On the night of December 16, 2021, Lily went with friends to the Out nightclub a couple of hours away in Pembroke. It's there that an intoxicated Lily met 31-year-old Lewis Haynes. Haynes' friend reminded him that he had a girlfriend and that Lily was far too young for him, but he didn't care. Eventually, the two ended up kissing inside the club before walking outside separately around 2 a.m. However, once outside, they once again started talking and then made their way to a nearby alleyway. It's there that a surveillance camera caught them making out once again. Haynes then tried to initiate sex, but Lily turned him down, making him very angry. Afterward, at 2.47 a.m., she called her mother to confirm she was still picking her up. They had already planned to meet at the Green Garage, but during their conversation, the call suddenly dropped. Anna then began trying to call Lily back, but after trying 30 times, she never answered and all the calls went to voicemail. At 3 a.m., a person living in the area heard someone screaming. Sadly, Anna would never talk to her daughter again. Eventually, Lily's topless body was found in the nearby freshwater reservoir called Mill Pond. Anna had unknowingly seen her daughter's killer walk past her car at 3.09 a.m. as she sat and waited for Lily to show up. Anna noticed that the man was shaking his head and holding his head in his hands. She found his behavior so strange that she decided to follow him. However, she lost sight of him when he entered some nearby woods. Turns out, after Lily rejected Haynes, he got so angry that he strangled her to death and dumped her body in the reservoir. Haynes was going through family court, trying to regain visitation with his child, and for some reason, he thought if anyone knew he wanted to have sex with Lily, it would hurt his case, so he murdered her. Haynes then went home and told his girlfriend what he did. He also confessed to his parents, but told them he murdered Lily because she threatened to accuse him of sexual assault. According to Haynes, the threat came after she discovered he was in a relationship. When police showed up at his mother's home, he confessed to the murder. In the end, Haynes was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. 